Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus the Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you've given us a time when we are concerned about our own welfare and the health of people in our congregation. And we ask that you help us to recognize that you are in control even when we are dealing with the virus as we've been dealing with that in globally. Help us, Lord, to remember that you are our God and that we are your people. Thank you, Lord, for intervening in our lives in a way that will allow us to love one another more than we did before. In your powerful name we pray. Amen. The gospel lesson for this Sunday is taken from the gospel according to John, the ninth chapter, beginning with the first verse. I'll be reading it off and on during the sermon. And the reason we're having the sermon by internet is that many of us are not permitted to contact a lot of people. And so in order to be obedient to God as he has written in John 12 and 13, I mean in Romans 12 and 13, we want to obey the authorities that are taking charge of the problems that we're having. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have a perspective that is a, a biblical perspective. And let me read to you just a few verses. As he passed, this is the ninth chapter, as Jesus passed, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not this man who sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Amen. One of the worst things that uh, I can think of is expressed in a joke, and I love telling jokes and I love to hear jokes. And the worst joke I've ever heard is the following joke. It was about a man who was in Nebraska and he was farming. He was a farmer who uh, wasn't very successful and he kept on praying to God, God, what do you want me to do? And suddenly, to his surprise, there was a voice that came from heaven. He said, sell the farm, sell the farm. And so he sold the farm and he had a fair amount of money and and he went back onto his knees and prayed some more and says, now God, what do you want me to do? Las Vegas, go to Las Vegas. And so he took his car and drove to Las Vegas and and when he got there, he heard a voice say to him, the Bellagio, go to the Bellagio Casino. And he went to the Bellagio and, and uh, the voice told him to go to table number seven, roulette table number seven. And he went there and, and uh, the voice came again and said, number nine, number nine. And so he put all of his money on number nine and the ball spun around and sure enough, it was right on number nine, but at the last second, it jumped right off the number and was no longer number nine, it was number six. And so he had lost all of his money and all that he had left was a clunker of a car that he hadn't traded in yet. And here he was with really uh, no money, didn't know what to do, and he decided to head back to Nebraska. And when he got to Nebraska, or when he was on his way to Nebraska, his car suddenly broke down. It overheated in the desert. And again, he fell on his knees and he said, God, he said, I'm without vehicle. I did exactly what you told me to do. I sold the farm, I took the money, went to Las Vegas, put it on number nine, and at the last moment, it comes up number six. Why, God? Why? And a voice from heaven says, I don't like you. Now, that is the worst joke that I can think of. But what has struck me so often when I talk with our people, they often feel exactly that way. They often feel that God somehow or another has it in for them that they are being punished when things don't go exactly the way they want them to go. 
that somehow or another God is not really caring for them. In fact, he does the opposite. He actually gets, it gets to the point where he punishes people for not doing what he says they should do. That is the worst perspective that we can have. There's nothing in scripture that would support the notion that God doesn't love us and therefore he's going to punish us with a big stick or a little stick or whatever. There's no support for that. But there's an interesting thought that I had this week and that is that we've been talking in our churches in our communities and TV with newspaper reports and so forth. We've been talking about the desirability of social distancing. The whole idea is that we should stay six feet apart because apparently the virus doesn't jump farther than that. Somehow or another we're supposed to uh, let everybody know that we don't want to shake their hands because this, it's possible that the virus will attack us. One way or another, social distancing has been touted as the answer, or at least part of the answer, to the problem of the virus. And I got to thinking about that. It's okay, I think, to have social distancing. But many of us are stuck in a cycle of spiritual distancing. And spiritual distancing means that as we try to deal with the, the uh, reality of the virus, we start getting mad at God for not doing what we need to have done. Why is it? Why is it that we are being punished in so many, it feels like punishment. You say there is no punishment, but that God himself will save us, that we are his people, and that he is our God. But in fact, it feels like there's a punishment. We get mad at God for not solving our problems. Why is it? He could easily solve this problem, but somehow or another, he doesn't do it. Somehow or another, he doesn't follow our directions. And why is that? What is it that we can do if God himself is not ready to do for us what we want? Well, there are several things that we can do and that I think we as a congregation need to do. The first thing is that we need to make sure that we admit that, the, that we are afraid. Some people have said, we don't need to shut down the church. We don't need to do this. We don't need to do that. If God wants us, He'll save us. He'll cleanse us from all iniquities, including this virus. But the reality is that most of us, when we're honest, may not yet be afraid because the virus hasn't hit us directly. But just give it time. We are told that if we don't do social distancing, we're going to have problems. And what I want us to know is that we should also be aware of the desi not the desirability, but the effort that we make to get our way the way we want and to blame God for what is going on. And that's spiritual distancing. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to do spiritual distancing. The second thing that we can do that I just want to point out, there are lots of lots of things that we can do, but the second thing that I think we must do is to turn over our problems to God. You see, it's true. You and I cannot solve this problem of the virus. We may have people as, as knowledgeable as Dr. Fauci. We may have all sorts of ideas that we can bring to bear on solving the virus problem, but at the very bottom of all of our efforts is the reality that you and I are helpless. We are afraid, and we are afraid because we are not in control, and we're not in control because God himself is the one who is in control. You know, there are, two, there are many wonderful stories in the Bible about how God helps and how God intervenes. One of my favorite ones is in the first uh, Kings 17th chapter, the, the widow of Zarephath, who uh, is dealing with a drought, and people are dying, as they did later on for Elisha. They are now he, the people are dying, and even though Elijah is there, and they appeal to Elijah, and lo and behold, Elijah shows up, and uh, he says to the people, and to the widow of Zarephath, do you have anything to eat? There's been a famine. And uh, uh, 
Aziraphath says, well, I just have this little jar of oil and a little jar of flour. And I was going to make a meal for me and my son. It's going to be the last meal that we have because we don't have any other goods that we can use to feed ourselves and to nourish ourselves. And Elijah says something strange. He says, that's okay. He said, why don't you go and make a cake with the oil and the uh, flour that we have, and then, after you feed me, we'll feed you. Isn't that a strange request? We are told not to be self-centered. It sounds to me like Elijah, as a man of God, is taking advantage of his position and is actually ordering her to do something that he knows or she knows or believes at least will not help. And so, but she does it anyway. She's obedient. And she does it in a way that not only feeds her and her son, but Elijah and his company. And the scripture tells us in the 17th chapter that they had enough to eat for a long, long time. And there's a reason why that's possible. And I'll come to that in a second. And because I want to point out one more in the sixth chapter of John. There's a passage in the sixth chapter where thousands of people have come to listen to Jesus. And uh, Jesus says, give them something to eat. And the disciples said, give them something to eat? We don't have anything. We don't even have enough money in order to feed ourselves. Give them something to eat, thousands of people? And then Andrew comes forward and says, I have this, these uh, two loaves, I mean five loaves and these two fishes. And you know what? You can bring those to me and I'll make sure that you have something to eat. And sure enough, Andrew takes the food, the fishes and the bread from, from the little boy. I hope he wasn't doing it forcefully, but he was taking it from the little boy and uh, they had enough to eat. The Bible tells us not only did they have enough to feed thousands, they had basketfuls left. And so that's the second story that tells us that even when we don't have the resources, we are able and capable of turning them over to Jesus. And that's the key. The key is not in the little bottle of oil or in the method that was used to bake some cakes for the widow and her son. It isn't in the fishes and it isn't in the bread. It's in giving what they have as little as it is to Jesus and letting him deal with that. And that's what we need to remember in these days. We need to remember that Jesus is in control. And that Jesus wants us to bring to him all the little things that we can because he is capable of what we are not capable of. And that is to turn bread and oil and flour and fishes into meals of joy and happiness, into meals that are wonderful. I read a story just this week which really struck me as a joyful story. It's about a group of uh, people, young people, it was in a, made in, into, into a movie apparently, and the movie was Whistling Down the Wind. And this group of young people, kids, you know, from age of four all the way to 12 and 13, they had a pet cat that they played with. And uh, the cat died. And so they were asking each other, and he says, why did God allow the cat to die? And they said, we don't know, but there's a minister who lives down the street, and maybe he could give us the answer. And so they go searching, this is in Britain, they go searching, searching for the vicar, and when they finally find him in a restaurant where he's drinking tea and eating crumpets, they, he, they come in and they say, uh, Reverend, we want to ask you a question. And he was not very pleased because this was his morning time that he had a habit of keeping and he was reading the newspaper and enjoying the tea and the crumpets. But then he thought, well, I am the minister of this community. And so he said, well, what is it that I can do for you? And one little girl stood up and said, uh, 
Pastor, would you tell us why it is that God would allow a cat, our cat, to die? And he sort of took a deep breath, rolled his eyes, and, but he gave him an answer and it took about 25, 30 minutes as any good sermon will, will last and uh, told them why theologically it was important for them to know that God does love them and, and so forth and so forth. And when he finished, he sat back down, didn't even say anything to them, and just returned to his tea and crumpets and, and the little group of kids walking out. And one little boy who was taking a hold of his uh, sister's hand looked up at her and said, he doesn't know either, does he? And I thought about that story. What a joy it is for us to know that we might not know the answer, but our Lord does. We might not be powerful enough to intervene in a way that makes a difference in the lives of people, but our Lord does. And that's what I hope we as a community of St. Paul will remember as we deal with the issues that are being, with which we are being confronted. God is all-powerful, and he loves you and me. Amen.